great. Um, for everybody in the room, thank you so much for joining us today for our very first on-site um, seminar in the new building and hybrid. It's very, very exciting. So thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, I just want to do a couple of announcements and introductions and um, then we'll get started. But my name is Cinnamon Moffat and I'm the host for today. We also have two other folks that are helping us out. We have Sana, um, who is going to be helping to moderate those folks that are online. So um, if you have any questions online, please make sure you ask Sana, just put it into the chat. She will help you navigate any issues you might have or let us know if there's anything going on that we need to fix on our end here in the room. The other person we have helping us today is Michael Banks. Michael Banks is the instructor for um, those folks that are taking this class for credit. If you have any concerns or issues and on, online, you can uh, chat him directly and he can answer you. If you are here and you're part of the class, you can talk to him when we're done. But both of these folks are gonna help us navigate a hybrid format today. Um, and I've gotta look at my notes because this is all a little new for me as well. Um, okay. Uh, just wanted to remind everybody that we are going to a hybrid format for some of our talks this fall. Some of our talks will be fully remote. So it's going to be really important that you kind of watch those announcements to see what format we're going to be using. Um, we're going to go back and forth a little bit, but we are excited to have the option to do a hybrid uh, when we can. Um, Going to ask for a little bit of patience today. Like I said, it's the first time we've done it in this room, the first time we've been back on site. So we might be a little bit bumpy, but we'll get there. Um, if you have any feedback, please let us know, put it in the chat, and we'll be monitoring that and we'll get better as we get along. Um, for those of you that are online, your mics and cameras and screen shares have been turned off, but we do hope that you interact with us um, using the chat uh, during the time, and we'll get to those questions at the end. We are also going to ask, if you want to ask your questions verbally, raise your hand, your virtual hand, and Sana will unmute you and let you know that you can ask the question at the end verbally. So feel free to do that. For those folks that are in the room, um, you might've noticed that we have asked that you are not eating and drinking in the space because we do want face covers to stay on while we're all together. If you need to step out of the room to get a drink, do those kind of things, the designated eating area is right out in the foyer. Um, if you haven't done it already, make sure you sign in. We do have to do contact tracing uh, and keep track of everybody. If you're new to this building, the bathrooms are right on the other side. So you have to go out and around, but they're there if you need them. Um, and for all of you in the room, if you have questions, we'll answer those at the end. You just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you, but you do need to use the mic to ask your questions. So those folks online can hear your questions. So that'll be a little bit slow and a little fun and I get to run around, but we'll work on it. It'll be good. Um, last little thing, logistics wise, if you feel the ground shaking, go to the roof. The uh, ramp is right outside. The elevator on that side of the building or the stairs will get you up there. We are in a vertical evacuation structure. Yay. Um, so nowhere to go and we'll get you there. Okay. Um, one other thing to note, we are recording today's event. So if you are interested in seeing this event or sharing it with others, um, E Chung, maybe you can put in the link on where to get to uh, the recordings uh, into the chat for us and people can see it there. Okay, we're almost there. <laughs> um, just wanna promote next week's seminar. Next week's seminar will be fully remote, so no on-site option. Um, so please join us online for Dr. O.K., the Director of Strategic Engagement at the University of California's David's Natural Resource System. And Dr. Pedersen, uh, Masters of Science Educator at uh, Black Lock Forest, they will be giving a talk saying the next best thing to being there, talking a little bit about how we switch to a virtual learning environment during COVID. So excited to hear about, about that a little bit more next week. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about any of our talks, please check uh, the HMSC website, log to the bottom and our calendar events are there. Okay, any questions before we actually start for today? Okay, I see nothing on in the room. Anything online, any questions or concerns as we get started? Everybody can hear, everybody can see. All right, looks good. Okay, so while you're all here, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about today's speaker. So um, since 2019, Jim Marquez has been the chief in, uh, I'm gonna say all your titles wrong. 
Jim, <laughs> the chief of the ecological effects branch of the US EPA's Pacific Ecological Systems Division in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, he has two bachelors from Eastern Illinois University in zoology and environmental biology. He has an MS in biology at the University of New Mexico and a PhD in zoology and uh, from the University of Wyoming. Um, Jim also serves at OSU's National Institute for Health Institutional Biosafety Committee, ensuring the safe and defensible uh, toxin and biohazards and genetic engineering research happens ethically um, and responsibly. Um, at EPA, he oversees research uh, of a diverse team of biologists, statisticians, geneticists, and modelers, and soil scientists working on all sorts of projects from on-site mine um, revegetation, modeling of wildlife populations, stable isotope chemistry, nutrient dynamics, and woodland fire smoke inhalation on sensitive communities, which is why he's here today. So I'm going to hand it off to Jim. Jim, you want to turn on your mic? I'm going to turn off the lights and we'll get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. I'm going to take this off. Feeling pretty healthy, fully vaccinated. I appreciate you having me. It's been a while since I was in front of a group. I, I get excited by these. And it may seem ironic that for the inaugural in-person talk for the Marine Studies Building, uh, we're talking about wildfire. But it has an effect on everything that happens terrestrially ends up in the ocean. And we'll talk a bit about that and some of the work that we're doing on water. Uh, we also have some cool research that I'm not talking about today. Uh, really, what I want to stress is EPA getting back in the game and climate change. Um, and we'll go over that in a bit, but uh, we're doing some interesting work on salmonids and cold water refugia. So uh, remind me to suggest, recommend, volunteer another speaker. So uh, there's a large cast of characters in the wildfire research that we're doing. And we have folks looking at air quality and water quality. And you can, I'm not going to read everyone's name here. In fact, I'm missing uh, several prominent players, but uh, it's a big collective effort. It involves, we have three branches, it involves all three branches. And I'll talk a little bit more about our structure so you have some place to hang that. As Cinnamon said, we're with the Pacific Ecological Systems Division. And this is <clears throat> what the EPA structure looks like. So on the left-hand side of the program offices, you've heard of the Office of Water, Office of Air. Those groups come up with, this is a safe level for say particulate matter in the air, PM 2.5, for example, the Office of Air will say, you know, nothing above 35 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, we do the same thing for water. This is a safe level, or well, not a safe level of lead, but not to be exceeded. Uh, and so, so those are the planners. And then there's the Office of Research and Development where I'm located. And then on the far right are the regions. And by far the largest group is the regions. So we come up with these standards and then the regions enforce them and find out who's polluting uh, and then levy fines, et cetera. So what I'm gonna talk about are some of the areas, particularly air, climate, and energy. So it's an, EPA is an interesting organization. We um, it's, it's ORD is largely academicians and we publish. That's, that's kind of how we say this is, we did a, you know, we earned our worth. It's difficult to publish when your organization changes radically every four years. For example, from Obama to Trump, the air, climate and energy program went to just air and energy. You know, it's like climate was fixed. So we're back to air, climate and energy. And we're focusing on the repercussions. Oh God. I'm having trouble. I turned off everything but my watch. <laughs> so um, so we're looking, so climate's right at the front and center, Matt, that and environmental justice in this administration. And uh, one of the repercussions of a warming planet are increased wildfires, as we'll talk about. We also have chemical safety and sustainability, safe and healthy communities, et cetera. They all focus on different things. Some focus on super funds, some focus on um, future risks, some focus on uh, you know, safe and sustainable water resources, kind of self-explanatory. Um, we're looking, the ACE program, air, climate, and energy is largely terrestrial and air related. Here locally, what that means is we have a campus 
in uh, Corvallis. You may have seen it if you're on 35th Street. And then we also have a campus here on Hatfield and uh, the Newport facility is just around the corner. Uh, it's the farthest look at the closest one to the bottom if you're looking at that. Uh, we have these numbers might be a little bit dated, but it's largely PhDs. We have about 60 staff. We have about as many contractors. We have uh, probably the best thing about the program is our postdocs. And so we bring in a lot of postdocs through the ORISE program. And they, um, they typically publish quite a bit and then make a name for themselves. And ideally, if it works out, they stay. And if not, they're well suited well prepared to go out in academia. So we have a lot of postdocs coming in every year. Um, <clears throat> again, cooperators, collaborators, we have these C employees or senior environmental employees um, and a lot of contractors. We recently renovated this building. It's right across the street from the OSU uh, uh, campus. And so it's a, a nice, it's not quite as nice as this, but it's, uh, it's nicer than it was when it was built in the 60s. And so it really needed to be renovated. So we're excited to move back into that. We're in the process of it. But what I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to get into our research, for the last three decades, we've been looking at this coast to crest network and when i say we this isn't the only thing we do this is just what one group happens to be doing and so we have climatological monitoring stations from the coast all the way into the cascades so from the coast to the crests and we have a, a in some way or form a, you know more than a, a two dozen stations so you have a, a meteorological station it's actually quite close to where we have our, our building we have those all over the place. And in addition to looking at wind speed and you know, the amount of solar radiation coming in, we're also going deep into the ground, a couple meters, and looking at what soil temperature looks like and soil moisture looks like over you know, for the Willamette Valley largely. And we have some really disturbing trends that we're seeing that um, California has preceded us and California is experiencing quite a bit more wildfire than we are. We're catching up quick, but I'll explain why we think that's happening with some of the trends that we're observing. So these monitoring stations um, are largely in Doug Fir, Sitka Spruce. Uh, they're, they're, they're far from um, uh, population centers. And the purpose of them has changed over time, but we're looking at them now to say, you know, what can we say about vulnerability to wildfire? <clears throat> and did I skip a slide? Nope. Okay, so one of our researchers is a statistician and he's really interested in the growth of trees. He looks at tree rings over uh, long periods of time and he can look at that um, Physically with something in front of them, he can do some modeling of tr tree growth over time. What we're seeing here, if you look at that graph, that's tree ring width. That's basically a proxy for the growth of a tree. The red is Western hemlock, the one that's dropping ra rapidly as we get into the 80s and 2000. Um, Doug fir looks like it's holding steady. It's decreasing a little bit, but this Western hemlock is, is rapidly uh, decreasing its growth over time. And why that's important is Western hemlock's a little bit more vulnerable to drought than Doug fir. It's kind of the canary in a coal mine. And so we're seeing that these trees, they're not dying outright, but they're not growing as heartily, heartily as they could have, as they had in the past. And we're measuring that with these rings. And you can see on the, uh, the far right-hand side, this is basically the coast, the West Coast, where we've got these stations and we're taking cores of these trees and we're looking at that and saying, oh man, this is, this is not gonna be good. Because you know these regional tree ring declines, as I said, California saw something very similar to this about a decade before. The trees weren't growing as fast and that was several decades leading up to it. We're just slightly ahead of them. Um, so California, slowly growing trees uh, predispose them to greater tree mortality. Greater tree mortality means more lumber sitting around to burn. And California, as anybody that's watching the news is on fire 
longer, more intensely, more widely than it ever has been. So the fire season never really ends in California now. It used to be fairly distinct, uh, but it's the air quality is just incredibly poor. I was actually just reading in um, NBC that air pollution kills about 4 million people annually. It's going up. Uh, the air pollution in the Western United States is, is getting much worse and it's largely due to wildfire. So we're breathing uh, quite a bit more particulate matter. There's a lot of bad actors that come with burning biomass and we'll talk about some of those. So um, warming planet, soils drying out, soils warming up. Um, that, so it's the, the number one correlate that we've seen though isn't so much air temperature, it's what's the result is that the, the moisture in the soils becoming less and less over time. We also happen to be in one of the biggest droughts that we've uh, in about 2000 years. Uh, I think, so I might talk about that again, but this drought is, uh, we haven't seen levels like this since about um, 800 before present time, 800 years after um, a current event. Is that CE? Current event? I don't know, <laughs> sorry, I digress. So what this means is that, you know, as the world, as the, the, world gets warmer as the soils dry out. This is a plot of wildfires. And you can see that, um, that it's dramatically increasing as of about 2000. And so we're projecting, it's, it's unfortunately, it looks like a log curve, right? So it's certainly gonna get worse. Um, and that seems inevitable. And so we're really focusing on the outcome. A, not necessarily climate change, but a symptom of climate change, a repercussion of climate change. And again, that's wildfire. And so I think I'm gonna be in business for a while if, if that's what I'm researching. Um, yeah, the amount, it's, it's really ballooned, especially in the last couple of decades. So that blip there on the far right corner, this is at 2020. So um, it's kind of terrifying really. And I don't mean this to be a downer talk, but it's just the reality of our, our current world. <clears throat> this was this uh, plot in the background was put together by a colleague of mine in uh, Raleigh Durham. Our headquarters for the Office of Research and Development is in North Carolina. So we have a lot of excellent wildfire researchers out there. The, one of the reasons why we're really ramping up here is because the East Coast is fairly well buffered for wildfire. Um, West Coast less so. It's just logistically, it's difficult to get a team out and study wildfire if you're on the opposite end of the, of, you know, the United States. So um, what Anna Rappold has found is that looking, I think these are data from 2008 to 2012, you can see there's two major areas where there's fires in the southeastern United States and then the West Coast. The southeastern United States isn't so much because there's a lot of wildfires there. These are largely prescribed burns. Prescribed burns are part of the agricultural um, milieu of just how you, how you do business in agriculture. You burn the fields. Um, they've got it down. We're, we're considerably further behind as far as implementing regular prescribed burns out west. And, and as well, I'm gonna talk about later, that's something we, we would like to change or we would like to influence. On the west coast, these hot spots and this, this, what you're looking at this color map is um, the number of days that the air has been above 35 micrograms per meter cubed of PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is two and a half micron diameter particles or less. And something that small, that's about one thirtieth of the width of a human hair. Something that small can pass through the, um, directly into the bloodstream from the lungs. And it, has, it results in inflammation. It results in a lot of um, adverse impacts on human health. So we have uh, from 10 to 55 days, above this EPA limit where you say, don't go higher than that, uh, that we experience seasonally now. And we're in ground zero here in Corvallis and Newport and the Willamette Valley. <clears throat> uh, 
So again, these, I don't want to be too iterative, but you know, increasing temperature and drought, more fire. And so we need to be able to respond to it more immediately on the West Coast. This slide shows you, if you remember the Labor Day fires, that's Corvallis and I'll run through it again. All that smoke just blanketed the Willamette Valley. So all these fires going on, blowing, and obviously Newport, if you were here, September, what, 10th, 11th, um, two years ago, 2020, that, that was uh, you were just, it was like pea soup. Um, and so that's kind of what our new, the, the new normal is looking like for us. That uh, graphically looking at some of the constituents of wildfire smoke, I'm sorry if you can't read that, that Y axis, this is PM 2.5. This black line here is the, uh, is the standard. And so you can see just by like orders of magnitude, how much we exceeded that. We had the worst air quality in the world for quite a while. PM 210, so that's 10 micron diameter particles. Um, similar, ozone is also associated with wildfire. Ozone has a, a variety of um, negative effects on respiration on, on us as humans, as vertebrates. Um, that increased dramatically and carbon monoxide increased dramatically. And so we were able to measure that on the Corvallis campus. Um, part of that breathing that pea soup and having the public say, oh my God, this is crazy. You know, what are you doing about an EPA? Our mission is to, to protect human health in the environment. And we look at air, water, and soil. So everybody breathing air was brought the problem to a forefront. This isn't new, but it would became um, inescapable for that period of time in our consciousness. And it's going to be continue that way. And so uh, Kate Brown put together this governor's council that involves the EPA and, and all the land management agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, uh, non-government organizations, tribal organizations, and have us all together. What we found is we're doing a lot of uh, the same thing. We wanna be smarter about it. We wanna, if the state's going out and monitoring an area, and we can fill in a gap where they're not monitoring, that would be useful. So we can say something more definitively about what everybody's being exposed to. And so now there's about uh, over hundred people that meet fairly regularly and talk about, and you know, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? And we're gonna put together a big database where we're sharing of where data are being collected relative to fires. So we're trying to be smarter and, uh, uh, work smarter, not harder with the limited resources we have. So where we fit in, we being the EPA, is this interagency monitoring and research group. So we're working with like the Department of Environmental Equality from the state. We're working with the USGS. We're working with the state's Department of Forestry, the, U, the US um, Forest Service. And we're combining resources and figuring out how to tackle this problem collaboratively. Here more locally, we're interacting with Oregon State, um, actually talking to Cinnamon about putting in some air monitoring possibilities here and looking you know, for what you guys get on the coast. How does wildfire, how does air quality change? How can we keep an eye on it? All related to climate change. Um, so the, the Pacific Ecological Systems Division, based on where we are, you know, in that, that couple graphs, a couple of slides ago, you know, ground zero of wildfires. That's where we are gearing up to be responsive to the future for the West Coast. This insert on the right, that was basically, that was the 2020 fires. That was the smoke that we just saw blowing all over, you know, Newport and out to the ocean. And, you know, we're talking to OSU, to University of Oregon, that ORD, again, to Office of Research and Development, there's a variety of organizations in there. I didn't say that ORD is kind of a small part of EPA. We're about 10% of the agency. So uh, 1,500 people versus 15,000 people. But within that 1,500 people, we're um, largely East Coast based, but we do a variety of things. I'm in the Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment. So they're combining ecologists 
with human health scientists for the first time and by design to get the, the ecologists and the health scientists talking and saying something like, you know, the, the soils are drying out here. You guys that do the epi epidemiological modeling may want to pay attention to in the future. We expect to see a lot more hospitalizations for respiratory issues. And so putting us all in the same center, we used to just kind of do our own thing ecologically and not, and that the human health is like, oh yeah, that's the human health side of EPA. So, so we're all at the same table now. <clears throat> um, and that's what I'm trying to show with this graph. So now we're getting in the meat of the presentation, and this is our approach to how, can you read that the, in the graphic here? Can you all see that? So basically this is a model of a burned area. And in that the, this is showing precipitation coming down on a burnt hill slope. That's putting ash, putting soot, uh, debris into the waterways. That's affecting, aquatic life downstream, we're looking at an increase, as you can imagine, with the fires going up dramatically, those, those uh, grasslands, um, forests are butting up next to populated areas. So there's this wildland urban interface where like towns like Paradise, California just got raised. I'm gonna have, I got a couple slides about the kinds of really nasty things you see in the air if you burn a town and cars and PVC pipe, et cetera. So we're trying to take a multi-pronged approach and saying how do fires affect water quality, water quantity, um, the, more, the more ecologically minded of us still looking at soil moisture and gases and ultimately how that affects air quality, water quality and human health. Okay, so this is, um, so this modeling effort is useful for us because it's, it's difficult to mobilize a large group of scientists. It's expensive to go out and burn an area and measure everything around it. We'd, um, we can actually pretty economically say, if we were to burn this amount of biomass in an area, how much of that would end up in the air? And we can go from that through a series of models to say, we expect to see this kind of surge in respiratory hospitalizations. And um, we've been able to do that. We just finished a big effort to say, uh, if we play around with the amount of biomass, so if we, and that, that's what I'm showing here, this is actually Crater Lake, Oregon. This was the Timber Crater 6 burn area of a, a few years back. And we said if it was you know, 10 times that size, if it was 20 times that size, if it was half that size, what would we expect as far as air quality impacts? <clears throat> and so we can look, we can project, it's not perfect. I mean, models aren't perfect, but they're, they're very informative. And we're providing the, the basic ecological information that then a health science model can go and say, you know, again, like we expect to see this number of hospitalizations as a result of this amount of biomass burned. And so we can use that information for the other land management agencies that don't have that health impact, that expertise that the Environmental Protection Agency does. In the past, people were like, why is the EPA talking to us about fire? You know, that's a forest service thing. I was like, well, you know, we, what, we can tell you about the implications of fire. <clears throat> Um, this is more information on a, a guy in my branch who's doing this. His name is Bob McCain. Sadly, I didn't put him as one of the authors, but um, I was an oversight. But we can model what we measured from the Timber Crater 6 fire, for example, down near Crater Lake, and we can get pretty close to what was in the air. And so that gives us confidence that we can say something definitively about this land management practice of prescribed fire. And if we feel confident of that, then we can project it somewhere else. It's not, there's, there's a lot of nuances based on where you are, the topography, the, the soil, the type of material that's getting burned. But that's, it's known information. It's not like, oh, well, we just couldn't do it. It just takes a little bit of work. So we have to parameterize the model. And if we can do that with the help of other agencies and information that they have, 
we can say something again definitively about, hey, these are the kind of health impacts we might be expecting in the Willamette Valley, for instance. <clears throat> and so that this was um, PM 2.5 and this was ozone. And these were, uh, these, these models are showing, this is the actual, what was measured, and this is what we can model. And they were pretty close. So that's a modeling exercise. We're also saying, you know, what, what's, we're pretty good at measuring what's in the air as an agency. So there's mobile monitoring objectives. We have a station in Corvallis uh, that's stationary and we can see what's coming across the campus, but there's a real need to go out and say what's happening at a fire. If, if the forest service does have a burn, you know, we can pull up a trailer we're proposing to them and say, we can measure everything that you're concerned about in the air and that we're concerned about in the air. So there's, there's these initiatives for a geographic need to be able to get to the source of the fire and measure what's there on site, the boots on the ground kind of approach. So what I wanted to talk, I got a few slides on state of the science equipment that we got um, that we already have and that we would like to purchase. And we're working with the regions on what we would like to purchase. You might've heard of this American rescue plan, um, hundreds of millions of dollars that the Biden administration is using to, to address COVID to respond to climate change. The EPA has about $5 million set aside specifically for mobile air quality monitoring. And the initial idea was to split that 5 million up among the 10 regions. So each of the region would get 500 grand. And, um, it sounds like a lot of money. It's not a ton of money when you're looking at multiple states. And so they all, we all thought, well, well, we'll build these trailers and we'll pull our equipment. Well, we invested about, and I'll talk about in the next slide. We invested over 500 grand just to get this trailer and uh, instrument it with basic air quality monitoring. So the EPA has six priority air pollutants carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides, sulfur oxides, um, particulate matter, um, <clears throat> heavy lead is one. We can do all of those except for lead with the equipment that we have here that we already actually have in hand. And so the Office of Research and Development is we're looking at about 750 grand that we've invested so far. Uh, we can't measure lead with everything that we have, but we can measure the rest and we have identical equipment on this mobile unit that we do on the campus. And why that's important is we can say, unit A is measuring the exact same thing, giving us the exact same data as unit B. So let's take unit B out now where the next fire is. So it gives us confidence that we're measuring the right thing um, to the extent you can scientifically. So we're calibrating our equipment at the stationary site and we're bringing it out and we're, well, we have yet, we're actually, I'm gonna pick up the trailer in about a month. We have two trailers actually, and um, it's really slick design. We have one that's basically for the instrumentation and another one that's just for the fuel. Now, you don't wanna bring a trailer full of like diesel gasoline into a fire. So this is actually a methanol water fuel cell. And we're generating hydrogen from it and that helps that to not compromise the data that we're collecting in air quality if we've got a generator just kicking out a bunch of exhaust you know that would compromise the, C, the carbon monoxide measurements for example so we've already have this so the regions were like well it's a non-starter for that 500 grand because we don't what were we going to do with an empty trailer when they found out we had this they're like oh my god those guys have it well why don't we figure out something i mean we have so many things we want to measure based on the needs of the regions and that's what this slide is talking about. It's pretty high state of the science instrumentation. And so region 10, which is Oregon, which is um, Washington, Idaho, is combining with region nine, which is California and Nevada, and saying, if we pool our resources and we use uh, Corvallis's trailer, we can get things like uh, time of flight mass spectrometer. We can measure complex uh, organic compounds in the air that we just couldn't do really before, not in a mobile way. And we can look at some of the really nasty things in the air. We can look at 
uh, particulate matter in a much more depth. We can not just everything 2.5 and less, we can say what is the actual distribution of particles. And it may not sound that important, um, but it is important. The smaller you get, the easier it is for these particles to get in your bloodstream and the more direct consequences there are for human health. So, so region 10 largely is leading this effort, but they want to, uh, they're proposing about $1.3 million worth of purchases to outfit our trailer. And one of the really nice uh, synergies of this project is the regions are responsible for air quality, um, enforcing air quality. Air quality is typically a problem in the winter. In, in on the West Coast, where, for example, the Yakima Valley, you have wood smoke, you have these inversions. Yakima Valley has got some of the worst air quality in the winter in the United States. And they're trying to understand how these montane valleys, you know, why, why does it pool here? Topographically, what's contributing to this poor air quality, this lack of turnover, where wildfire is not such a big deal in the winter for us in the Pacific Northwest, what we're really interested in using the trailers in the, the spring and the summer. And so we figured we can use it in the fall, they can use it in the winter, and we're all benefiting from it. And so this is the first time that these disparate groups within the same agency um, are all talking together and all like, hey, let's, we're all on board. So I'm really excited about this massive effort to get the West Coast, um, response network going within the EPA. It's the first of its kind. I'm not gonna go into the details of every one of these pieces of equipment, except for one of them. This, uh, this is an X-ray um, fluorescence XRF instrument. It's kind of like this, uh, the BAM, which is used for a particulate matter, but it looks at the fluorescence of the uh, inorganics, heavy metals on particles. And so we can say, you know, how much lead is in there, how much zinc is in there, how much manganese is on these particles. <clears throat> and that's important when you get into a situation like this, where you do have a brush fire that's now bumping up against a town. You're burning cars, you're burning the tires, you're burning the exposed PVC, you're burning the asphalt shingles, all these structures, all the things that go into that, what was not contributing to pollution is now released in a worse form than it was before. And so there are, uh, in the campfire in 20, uh, I guess that was, yeah, 2021, this is when the report came out. Anyway, there were hundreds of pretty dangerous compounds that were measured in the air. We have heavy metals, really elevated levels of lead downwind of the fire. When we had the Labor Day fire, Back uh, in 2020, we saw really high levels of manganese in the air, and we're not really sure why. This is all new. So we're just trying to figure out, you know, what are we being exposed to? If you remember back in Portland, I guess, was that in 2019 when um, bullseye glass, when they, when they were measuring heavy metals and moss, and they found that in this particular neighborhood area in Portland, it was super elevated in this moss, and they were able to trace it back to this glass facility and say, you know, this is, it was churning out quite a bit of just gaseous heavy metals. And moss is a really good collector of heavy metals, um, not super high tech. So we want to go out and say, you know, we can pull up our trailer and say what specifically is in the air at any given time. Um, <clears throat> carcinogenic compounds, fires naturally produce dioxins, but we also have some pretty nasties like benzoapyrene and benzene, and I'll talk about that a bit more related to the water. PFAS is something that the agency has been really interested in following up on. PFAS can be used in flame retardants. So if there is a structure fire, if there is a facility that's burning, the foam that's used as a fire suppressant can contain these polyfluorinated alkyl substances, which are toxic in and of themselves. So these are what we're proposing to study some of these fires, um, you know, not just from our laboratory and like hopefully something wafts across the campus, but pulling the laboratory to the fire. This, these, these folks are looking at a, a melted pipe. One of the things that we saw after like the Paradise Fire were big spikes of benzene in the water and the drinking water supply. And we're like, how the hell did that get there? I mean, we didn't even think to look for benzene because it's just not typically in there. 
But if you think about all these pipes that are exposed now and burnt and melt, uh, melted, and that goes into the drinking water. And you know, you level a town, there's, there's some pretty nasty stuff in man-made materials. Um, so these high density poly polyethylene pipes um, have been shown to release things like benzene. Uh, this is another picture of devastation. You know, this was outside of Gates, Oregon. That was what was left. And these were um, the infrastructure. So these are water meters on the right, you know, which is completely melted. Um, this, this stuff that you don't see, some that you do see, a lot of stuff that you don't see just gets fried, as you can imagine, in these, these intense blazes. And so um, we're going out, right after the wildfires of the Labor Day, we went out and sampled about 35 different streams and rivers in the Willamette Valley. And we've been doing that periodically since the fire to see what's ending up, what's washing off the hill slopes, what's getting deposited in surface water bodies, what kinds of, of things are getting elevated that hadn't been before because of these fires. And one of the interesting things is fires release a lot of nutrients. Um, we think that's probably one of the contributors to the big harmful algal blooms that were affecting um, Salem's water from the reservoir there. There was a fire a couple years before that. So you get elevated phosphates, you get elevated nitrates, you get these blooms, the blooms can produce toxins that ends up in a drinking water, people get sick. Salem, I think was on bottled water for I don't know how long, but um, it has a big impact and it's probably going to get worse. So what we would like to do is, in this on the left is a fire suppressed forest, which is sadly most of the West. We've had um, decades of fire suppression practices. We have a lot more fuel than we have in the past. And when you have a lot more fuel, you have hotter, more intense fires going from the top to the bottom, and ultimately just clear, raise a, a landscape. If you have more ecologically managed fires, like what, by that I mean just not this artificial maintenance or fire suppression and allowing fires to come back into the ecology of the landscape, uh, less dense fuel de deposits, less intense fires, you have more resiliency from to, from a, to a fire when more standing active growing biomass following a fire. And we're looking at that from a modeling perspective, from actually getting out there and measuring what's in the air, what's in the water, and hopefully using that information to make a, a better decisions about where to burn, when to burn, um, how much to burn. And it's, it's kind of, a, and how ultimately all those are gonna impact human health and the environment. So again, um, this is my last slide uh, talking about partnerships with regions uh, nine and 10 and within uh, the Office of Research Development itself. Um, we have a variety of relationships, a variety of organizations we have relationships with uh, the, at the state level, at the local level, at the federal level. And we're all starting to talk to each other. Uh, it's probably high time that we are. Um, so it's, I'm excited about the future and this integrated network of scientists that are all sharing information. And um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you all have here in the audience and online. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Um, so for folks online, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, if you want to ask a verbal question, go ahead and raise your virtual hand. If you have questions in the audience, raise your real hand and we'll start working through and we'll answer some questions. So I'm gonna hand the mic to Michael. He's gonna read one of our questions online. So this is a question from Laura Jacobs. Um, will the trailers be sent out to prescribed burn areas to measure the differences and impacts from these burns as well? Yeah, that's, that's the plan, a part of the plan. For us, the regions are less interested in, they're not uninterested in the prescribed burns. They're more interested in some of the more pressing problems that they have of why is there such poor air quality in wintertime, for example. So um, 
the Office of Research and Development absolutely wants to pull these trailers to where where the Forest Service is doing a burn, for example. Yeah, and then you know, measure what are the emission factors of the particular types of biomass, uh, what you know, what's ending up in the air, and we would also like to combine it with co-located water samples. You know, and see is there you know is there a big manganese pulse in the water in the air you know and why is that mercury is often released from wildfires so it's elevated in the air and in the water we didn't see it so much with the labor day fires and it's quite possible we missed it um, we're kind of new at this uh, when i say that we're new at following post fire impacts on air and and water um, However, we, the, the campus on Corvallis is actually one of the main groups that's responsible for sampling nation, water quality nationwide. So every year we look at streams and rivers and lakes and estuaries, and we look at it in such a way that uh, it's a statistically rigorous design. We can say something about every stream in the United States based on how we've designed this, how one guy, this National Academy statistician that's working for us, that he's 80 years old. I hope he holds on a little longer, but he's a genius. And so, um, so we, we can say without much more than latitude and longitude what the water quality is of any water body in the United States. Uh, and we've been doing this for about 15 years now. I'm Michael. All right, we've got a question in the room, so I'm gonna work my way up there. We're gonna try to take turns back and forth. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about public interface. So I'm, I'm from California and I've definitely been in the situation where there's a fire burning in an urban area and a fire burning in a wildlands area. And you don't really know where the smoke is coming from. And, you know, I use apps like Purple Air and you kind of have like a color grading system but with all this granularity of information that you're getting, I'm kind of wondering how that gets out to the public so we can make really informed decisions about our exposure. Yeah, the, uh, that's a great question. The Office of Research and Development has come up with this app called SmokeSense. I don't know if you have that, it's free, it's available to everybody and they can say, here's where the fires are, here's what we expect you to be experiencing. And so, um, and it's 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 quite popular. It's um, there's tens of thousands of users on it right now, and so it's it's a way to say um, you know again what's your exposure and what you can do about it. So it's not just like you know run and hide, but you know here's some, some approaches. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work on how to improve indoor air quality. Real simple stuff like it could be anything from a filter screen that you would put in your furnace, but hooking it up to a, a wall fan and reducing the impact of the air quality. Like in some places in California, for some, some socio-demographic sections of, of you know, the population, like a, a, a agricultural worker, they're exposed all day and all night you know, if a lot of the West Coast relies on swamp coolers, which is pulling in, it's not doing anything to filter it. It's just adding moisture and cooling the air that way. But, you know, and so it was a really cool design that we, we EPA sponsored, a, a, you know, how to improve a contest. Who's going to come up with the best design to improve indoor air quality? And these folks had a really low cost, ingenious way to, to filter some of that, what's coming in through a swamp cooler. So at least you could sleep with a little bit less pollution. But yeah, check out Smoke Sense. I'll also let you know that on the top of this building, we do have um, a 2.5 PM 2.5 that is um, monitoring at least that level. And you can find that on OSU Smoke Map. And then hopefully, which is one of the reasons why I invited Jim here, we're gonna expand that with more instrumentation um, in the next couple of years working with his team. But we've got a question online, so I'm gonna hand it to Michael. I have three questions online. So <laughs> first one from Joe. You mentioned that nutrients were released during fires that could contribute to ogre blooms. That's right. Are these nutrients released from organic matter that is burned or from the fire retardants that are applied during the wildfire fighting activities? 
the former. So all the, as you can imagine, all the nitrogen compounds in a, in a tree, for example, are getting oxidized. So they go from, you know, an amino acid to nitrous oxide. It released as particulates and ash get released as a gaseous form. Um, and that ends up getting washed into waterways. And so uh, pretty well documented that nu nutrients and phosphates for the same reason get liberated from, you know, previously stable cellulose, you know, enclosures, trees, bushes, and um, end up in the waterways as, you know, uh, readily available for algae. And so we get these huge algal blooms. But yeah. Okay, we've got a question in the room. Thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. And it's really nice to see the monetary investment that's being made into that level of really deep science. That's great. The question I kind of have is around dispersion. Dispersion is a really trippy, tricky topic. And then kind of leveraging off what people have already asked, has there been any thoughts to try and do some kind of citizen science campaigns, kind of leveraging these really cheap, low cost PM 2.5 sensors? Yeah. Where you could kind of leverage a lot of distributed networks and look at dispersion and kind of inform these models? There's a, a huge effort in that. And that's a, it's a great question. Part of the problem we've had in the say, hey, you know, uh, Corvallis or um, Willamette Valley, this is your air quality, but it's based on a handful of stationary, you know, um, very limited number of samples. So you can have a vastly greater sample size input with much cheaper uh, monitors, purple air, for example. Part of the problem we had is that the purple airs aren't as accurate and they get weird if like there's more moisture in the air. And so all of a sudden, EPA is a, a super, EPA is sued all the time. I, I like to think we're doing our job with if the liberals and the conservatives both really irritated with us because we're either doing way too much or not nearly enough. So when we do something, we make sure it's the high, the state of the science, the most defensible, really expensive instrumentation. It's not real practical for a municipality to use that kind of um, type instrumentation. So we wanna empower more of that distributed network of a lower cost sensor, and then come up with correction factors to say, here's the moisture in the air, here's what we think is the highest level standard of information, here's, how those correlate and then make a much um, more granular picture of what people are being exposed to, you know, per meter squared. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Question online. Question from Ryan. With a four year turnover in leadership and changing priorities, how can policy be, been, be developed and implemented with proper oversight pertaining to the data or the, the ORD team and EPA develops? It's a good question. <laughs> it's messy. Um, however, both Republicans and Democrats can both agree that they want clean air and clean water. And so that typically is uh, not everyone agrees that, hey, we should do away with fossil fuels um, or our reliance on it to the extent there is. But most everyone is like, yeah, clean, clean air is a good thing. And so um, when Trump came in, he tried to eliminate, or clean water is a good thing. He tried to eliminate funding for the Great Lakes programs. And it was, um, luckily, we got like zero lined. I think Trump wanted to eliminate the entire agency. And if, if people can agree, yeah, EPA is a pain, they can sure agree, well, those scientists and ORD are, are completely worthless because they're not even regulating. They're just you know, doing science projects. And so um, the, it was proposed to do away with my part of the organization. And the senators all stepped up and said, no, no, this is important to my constituency. Uh, we were gonna fund EPA at the same level. So we didn't see a dramatic decrease in funding. I'm really glad that there wasn't a second term and nothing against uh, you know, people that might be pro-Trump, but that would have been devastating, I think, for our organization. Um, EPA is one of the less secure agencies. We kind of exist at the whim of whatever the um, executive powers are. There are some like uh, FDA is considerably more buffered. 
you know, hard to argue that safe food is, is, is not desired by everyone. But yeah, so it's, it's tricky and it's a, it's a, it's, I'm kind of new with the agency, so I, I don't want to misspeak. And I want to also state that these are my views. These aren't the agency views. So I probably have some people many levels above me that are like, would be turning over right now if they heard, heard this talk, but it's, it's hard to do. You know, you have dramatically different mandates and we try to respond as best we can. What I can say is the agency just doesn't automatically shift with whoever's in place. We're, we're career scientists and Sometimes we're less vocal or more vocal about what we're doing, but we're probably going to keep doing what we're doing. And you didn't join the agency because you don't believe in the mission, typically. All right, I think we have another question online. Yeah, this question is from Tabitha. Uh, do the pollutants in the air stay long term or do they essentially wash out when the rain comes? Um, they uh, that's a tricky question to answer. There, are, um, of course, they do. Precipitation takes the majority of, say, fires, uh, whatever it got aerosolized, and takes it, you know, with the nucleation of water into raindrops, and ultimately into water bodies. Stuff stays in the air for a surprisingly long time, though. Um, I was just talking with Cinnamon about these, the Australian wildfires of last year. We saw a huge impact of those fires in the Southern oceans, as far as this all of a sudden huge algal blooms. And what we've realized is that long-term over period, you know, these, these uh, aerosols were in the atmosphere for quite a long time and made it really far from any continent farther than typically dust gets blown out. Like, so, you know, any kind of windstorm is gonna pick up soils and deposit minerals, but the Southern oceans are, have almost everything necessary for phytoplankton growth, except for iron. And so they saw that these fires from Australia actually just jacked up the iron levels and the phytoplankton responded competently. We had huge phytoplankton bloom. So they, they can last, these particulates can last in the air for, for, and I'm a bit out of my league. I'm a microbial ecologist just picking up fire. So I would refer the question, whomever's asking the question to a atmospheric scientist, but I was surprised at how long things stay in the air. Any other questions in the room before we go back to those online? Great, one second. Great talk. Um, I'm having trouble formulating my questions. I'm going to give it my best uh, best effort. But um, I guess one thing that came to mind is so with all this information, um, it's really cool to get that fine details of what what um, particles are in the atmosphere. Um, if you're able to trace it back to certain materials like the pipe burning or PVC pipe, do you envision that as communities get rebuilt um, that they will take that into consideration when they with what materials they use? Or, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, California is already enforcing a lot of new codes for where you can build and what kind of fire perimeter is necessary now and probably down to the materials um, that could be used. But yeah, it's having a direct, you know, we just, we, it's, I think everybody sees the writing on the wall that like towns are going to burn more and more. And how can we be smarter about it and protect you know, and not maybe build right in the middle of a forest with trees over us, but, um, you know, to reduce some of that fire break, uh, create a fire break and reduce some of the structural materials that are getting just blazed. But yeah, there's, I know that there's quite a bit of research into that too. Of how can you be smarter and more resilient about building structures in a wildfire prone zone? If you're curious to see that, they just did some work around uh, OCC's campus um, and created a fire break uh, just, I think, this summer. So you can actually see what they were doing. Um, I think we've got time maybe for one more question. Michael, anything online? Sana, anything online? Okay, last question. So from Jacqueline, aside from prescribed burns, what other forestry practices are being looked at to improve forest health? Perhaps less monoculture, 
more micro mycorrhizal support? Uh, potentially, um, I'm what I'm most familiar with are, are prescribed burns. I mean, there's really there's two ways to deal with wildfire. Um, you either more more timber harvesting or prescribed burns, but you just basically ways to reduce the fuel. And so um, I don't know about concerted efforts to increase mycorrhizal um, resiliency, for example. Uh, that may be the case, but we're dealing with massive, just this landscape of the West. It's one of the reasons we are so far behind the Southeast. It's less populated. Um, there's just, there's it's so much more land. Um, in the Southeast, it's much more densely populated and individual farmers can burn their fields and have been doing that for you know decades and decades where it's it's we're not going out and burning forest land as we just we have a lot we're putting the we the government is putting a lot of money towards fire suppression has been putting very little money towards um, fire prevent for um, just fire resiliency and that's starting the shift um, shockingly, but I mean, it's taking these fires and, and the constituency saying this is unacceptable. Part of the problem with prescribed burns is people don't want those either. I mean, they have impacts. No, they're not impactless. You're putting particulate matter in the air. You're putting all these carbon monoxide in the air. Um, ideally, you could do it in a way that you're also not going to burn a town down in the process. And so, um, we have a lot, a lot to learn and uh, ways to go, but we're, we're trying to do it as intelligently as we can. But. All right, everyone. I want to just thank our presenter today um, for coming out and spending some time with us. So thank you very much, Jim. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, one of the amazing things is uh, when you're here on site, if you have questions, you can actually go up and ask Jim, um, which we haven't been able to do in a long time. For those folks where we didn't get to your questions online, we'll actually ask Jim after we turn the lights on and let folks go, because I know we're pushing our time, um, but we'll get some of those questions answered as well. For everybody, um, just reminding you that next week's seminar, same place, same time, except it'll only be online. So please join us on our fully remote um, seminar next week. And again, thank you so much. And it was fun to be in the building and fun to see everybody. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. If you're still online with your questions, we'll get to you in just a second. Hang in there. Sure. So Joe, uh, this is Mike here, and we got the speaker right here. So I'm going to read your question to him, and um, 
or you know you if you like to unmute uh, you can join us yeah okay i'll just i'll just read it so a recent he can't unmute himself uh, i can do it yeah there you go that worked oh there you, there go. you go all right <laughs> do you want to just talk your question yeah sure uh thanks for the talk and i just had a a, a follow-up question. There was a recent NPR piece. Uh, I can't actually remember the name of the program. It's the one out of Portland. And they were interviewing someone about uh, what the wildfires and, and actually some of the psychological effects that are having, uh, that humans are having and, and just research in general associated with wildfires. And uh, the angle was that there, uh, since the purse strings are pretty much controlled on the East Coast out of Washington, DC, that there has been limited uh, wildfire research and the effects of wildfire because it's uh, seen as a West Coast problem. And I was just wondering if you're seeing that from the EPA side as far as uh, having troubles releasing funds to, uh, you know, Region 10, Region 9. Uh, yeah, I think that's a valid. If you ask Governor Newsom, I think he'd say absolutely. Um, you know, it's kind of, that's a California problem. That's an Oregon problem and not a United States problem, but it, you know, obviously we, we differ or disagree. What we find is um, that there's a lot of, within the agency, we're kind of new players. We being this, this, we're the one office of research and development lab on the West coast, actually the one lab West of the Mississippi. And so everything else, the other 15 labs are all on the East coast. And so we get kind of frustrated that, hey, the problem's here, and then they're funding the people that they've always funded on the East Coast. And, and that's just because the government wheels turn slowly and people you know, kind of do what they did anyway. And so we're just trying to change the conversation and saying, you know, we're here and we're players and we're, we're starting to get some serious funding. I mean, so you saw that we had, I think it's about 650 grand now that we've invested here locally and we're hoping to get um, two or three times that with the next bowl of some money. It's just, it's, it's happening slower than we'd like and it's not going away and it's the funding and the resources the agency's putting at it is getting more and better every year. But yeah, it's... um. I could see that perception of the not a very responsive White House, although um, the Biden administration had a lot of talks with um, Western governors and with Western tribes and saying, what are your what are the issues that you're worried about? And wildfire was right near the top. And so a lot of listening sessions and hopefully that translates into action. Uh, thanks. And actually, that's an interesting perspective that I hadn't taken, but I, I do know that uh, as far as the Forest Service and their effects on uh, wildfires and fish species, they they turn to the East Coast as well. Uh, as far as working with uh, the USGS Environmental Lab out of Columbia, Missouri, so I think that might also be a carryover. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah you don't just switch overnight from the group that was all already doing most of the work to these upstarts on the West Coast. You know, it, it's uh, the wheels of the government turn slowly. Um, again, we're trying to change that and uh, speed it up here. And yeah, I, I constantly say, we, you guys, we're the only lab on the West Coast. You know, we need more help. We need more people. We need more resources. And that's part of my job. So, um, yeah, uh, we have a very, the USGS here, the guy, uh, Craig Carpenter, I don't know if you know, Kurt Carpenter, sorry, if you know him, he's great. But he's really helping mobilize all these different groups and, you know, get us all on the same page. All right, well, I won't take up any more time in case others have questions uh, behind me. Cool. But thanks. Thank you. Are there more questions, Michael? Okay.
for anybody online. We're going to wrap up. Thank you so much. We'll end the meeting and hopefully see you next week.